This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 306, recorded on March 7, 2024. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. And Charleston has now gotten Chamber of Commerce weather. We are beautiful mid-70s. The sun is out and spring has sprung. So my nose is running like a drain. The pollen is everywhere. Here in New York, it's 11C and Ooh. cloudy. So joining us from St. Louis, Missouri, Petra Levin. It's good to be here. We have cloudy and probably about 50 degrees Fahrenheit, so not too different from New York. Mm. And uh, yeah, we had 70 mid-70s earlier in the week, and my allergies are also going a little crazy. <laughs> Allergy um, season. It, right. so, so it begins. And so it begins. Exactly. Well, it's, it doesn't last all of summer, so it, right? it ends after the spring, presumably. We're praying. We're praying. <laughs> All right, for you today, we have a snippet and a paper, and Petra is going to tell us about our snippet. Okay, so this snippet is a paper from last year that's entitled Natural Products from Reconstructed Bacterial Genomes of the Middle and Upper Paleolithic. And this paper is actually quite interesting for a number of reasons. First of all, just how they uh, sort of are getting ancient genomes. Um, and then also natural products. So there are many things that bacteria synthesize that are made in these biosynthetic clusters. And some of them are things like amino acids, right? You have multiple genes that synthesize amino acids. So these are chemicals and some things that we like to have these variations in natural products we can get from different organisms come from these biosynthetic clusters, including antibiotic or antibiotic platforms. So this paper is by Martin Klapner, and I'm not going to, it's a very, a relatively long list. So Martin Klapner and Alexander Hubner and Anan Ibrahim are the sort of, sort of first set of authors. And the senior author on the paper is Pierre Stallforth, and they're from the Leibniz the Department of Paleobiotechnology at the Leibniz Institute for Natural Product Research and Infection Biology in Jena, Germany. And this paper, I think, is cool because normally when I think about getting natural products, a lot of people get these, uh, they isolate organisms from the soil. For example, the actinomycetes, which make streptomycin and some other antibiotics, also make some other excellent uh, sort of chassis for building other chemical, bioactive chemicals on. So those you just dig in the soil at different places to get these organisms out. Uh, they actually, instead of sort of doing a more standard isolate from the environment system, they actually go and they look at uh, teeth. They're looking at sort of the sort of harder stuff that forms on teeth from samples from um, so the dental calculus, again, that's the stuff they scrape off with that pokey thing at the dentist every six months, um, of 12 Neanderthals and 52 anatomically modern humans ranging from 100,000 years ago to the present day. And then they reconstruct the metagenomes of these guys, of the organisms they find. So they find the DNA. The older stuff is more damaged than the newer, obviously. Um, but then they reconstruct these genomes and then they look for biosynthetic clusters, clusters of genes that make these different chemical compounds in the genomes of the ancient bacteria. So there's a couple things going on. First of all, isolating bacteria from these uh, sort of archaeological samples. And then the metagenome reconstruction, which is always quite interesting. How do you decide what goes with what? And then kind of figuring out which the biosynthetic cluster is. Is it something that's in new organisms or, you know, modern organisms or only in these older organisms? And then trying to make that new natural product um, since these organisms don't exist. 
basically, uh, they're combining tools for metagenome assembly with computational tools for predicting what's a biosynthetic cluster. And that's kind of how they get there. But they have to start somewhere. And so they start by scraping uh, the dental calculus from these. Uh, they actually they didn't actually start these. These are older data sets. They look in these data sets. They call them metagenomic data sets uh, from essentially Neanderthals and uh, more modern humans. And the human ones date, the Neanderthals are 100,000 to 40,000 years ago. The human ones date from 30,000 to 150 years ago. And then they have 18 present day humans. And they actually get a good number of reads for all these guys. Um, and they had, um, you know, longer contigs, better reads with the more modern humans, which makes sense. But they were uh, actually, they got pretty decent assembly of these metagenomes, despite them being so old and also from teeth. So they, so they have these metagenomes. And I actually learned something about metagenomes in general, that often when they do these metagenome assemblies, they don't get the ribosomal RNA genes. Um, I possibly because they're too long in the short reads, or they're hard to assemble, because it's hard to know with conservation what's from what? What's what? Um, How what's old what? they are? Right. Is this from a modern human or in the end? I mean, because they're so well conserved, right? They look at the overlap between what they, they first of all, assemble these genomes and they find one thing that, I mean, and they stick with it. It's actually really interesting. They find um, bacteria that are chlorobium in the teeth of the ancient samples. So one of the metagenomes they get that they're most interested in are these chlorobium. And so these are photosynthetic organisms. They're not like something you would expect to find in the mouth where obviously <laughs> there's less light unless people are walking around with their mouths open all the time, which I doubt anybody ever did. So they have to speculate about that. And they think maybe they were drinking contaminated water, which makes sense. Maybe they mm. were drinking water that had, uh, you know, you could imagine green algae or mm -hmm. these so or they could have been drinking green algae as a nutritional supplement like many people in health clubs do. Exactly. Maybe they were having spirulina smoothies. Yes. <laughs> but, chlorobium smoothies. Maybe. But <laughs> in any case, I found that kind of interesting that that's what they went after. But I think it was because those were the genomes that seemed to have diverged. Um, they, they found some other kind of interesting divergent things, but those ones are the chlorobium. <laughs> And they were basically, in addition to not being typical of microbiota in the mouth, they were also definitely a clearly separate clay group of bacteria from the modern chlorobia. So and it should be pointed out that chlorobium is a photolithotroph. So it uses yeah. both light and rocks. It, it basically grows on sulfide. Hydrogen sulfide is its electron donor as opposed to water and normal photosynthesis. So it's really pretty unusual in whether or not where all this sulfur is coming from quite intrigued me. And I sort of, when you sent the paper, I sort of was panic stricken because I haven't told my dental students about chlorobium in the oral cavity. And I broke out until flop sweat going, what did I miss? And fortunately, I don't think I missed anything. No, but that water must have tasted terrible. Oh, yeah. It, it must I mean, have actually, been like really Florida, sulfury. Yeah. So Florida, parts of like South Florida have very sulfury tasting water. So I'm imagining that's, that's where drinking. it came from. I mean, it won't hurt you, but it's not the most appealing thing. In we've all been to Disney World and we've <laughs> drank in the water from the water fountain because we refused to pay $4 for a bottle of water. <laughs> Four dollars. Oh my gosh, that's cheap. Yeah, I, I would actually pay ten not to drink sulfur water. <laughs> yes. Um, in any case, they find these. So that was kind of weird, but also uh interesting. And they make sure that it's old DNA. They look for essentially a certain number of lesions that happen over time in DNA, and they can have a match set from other ancient DNA that they call securely oral taxon. So ones that probably are only in the oral cavity. Um, and they, they are the right age. So that's kind of how they confirm that what they found is not a contaminant, although it would be a little odd to have chlorobium as mm -hmm. a contaminant. 
And it seems to be its own monophyletic clade. So it's related to a modern one called Chlorobium limicola. Um, but again, it's its own special clade. And this is actually shown in figure 2A. And so uh, they now have it. They can pretty much show that it's different, it's separate, it's ancient. And then what they do is they use a bioinformatic tool called anti-smash to go through the metagenome to try and identify biosynthetic genes that make secondary metabolites. So, so sort of these complex, more complex molecules that could be useful. And they find four different biosynthetic clusters, which make butyrolactone and terpenes were the most prevalent. So they're making these molecules, which are useful. Um, they've been found in streptomyces, basically almost every biosynthetic thing that's made out there. You can find in, in the streptomyces, again, these soil bacteria. Uh, but they haven't been found in the chlorobialis. Um, they, again, confirmed that the contigs that they were looking at, these sets of DNA, actually were age-related by looking for DNA damage, and they are from this group. So that's pretty interesting, actually. And they're probably identifying them because of the codon bias for the proteins, because chlorobium being a photolithotroph has its own set of tRNA predilections for amino acids, as do the others. Right. So they can say it's also probably in the chlorobialis because of the codon bias, but they also can age match it. And again, they're mm-hmm. really, whenever you do these ancient DNA metagenomes, you get so little material. I think you're just always worried about some kind of contamination. Um, so it doesn't seem like that's the problem. Okay. So they have these metagenomes. They're ancient. They're from tooth samples, which is not unexpected, which is unexpected. Um, So the next thing that they want to do, and again, this is what you would do if you had a a non-cultural sample, even a modern sample, um, you want to see if the genes actually make something because it's possible that the cluster is silent or that it's somehow not actually what you think it is. Um, So to do this, they actually take the ancient coding coding sequences of these three core genes, and uh, they basically put them into expression systems. They have a broad host range plasmid, a plasmid that can replicate in different uh, organisms or a vector to determine what's required. Because again, they're just guessing what's needed in these biosynthetic clusters. And they put it into an engineered strain of pseudomonas protogens, uh, which they call an expression chassis. So I imagine they're just been used to try and express different biosynthetic clusters. They also use, to make sure it's not just the, you know what's ever in the pseudomonas vector, they also put it into another bacterium called photorhabdis. So to make sure that what they're making is specific to the ancient chlorobia and not something that's like a Frankenstein made by the two different organisms together, they put it into uh, photorhabdis and then the pseudomonas. So they're pretty far apart. They, from a uh, three liter fermentation, so pretty big uh, fermentation, they actually get some compounds out and they can easily figure out the formula, but then they use... NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, and gas chromatography, coupled with electron impact mass spectrometry, which I'm not familiar with. Maybe Michael or Vincent is more familiar with this. (laughs) Um, They use this to elucidate the structure because it's very easy to figure out they have this many carbons and this many hydrogens and this many oxygens, but it's very difficult to know what the structure is. And the structure, again, is really important to know what you're looking at. And they get two previously unknown 5-alkylfuran 3-carboxylic acids with C7 or C9 alkyl side change, which they name paleofuran A and paleofuran B. And they actually can synthesize this chemically, and they get actually a pretty good yield when they do it, you know, outside the organism. So they have these guys, and they can make them. So, so far, they've shown they can isolate them. These organisms assemble their metagenomes, find biosynthetic clusters, and then use those biosynthetic clusters to make ancient product, Mm. which I think is pretty neat altogether. 
And really, like, what's the point of this? I think it's really proof of principle. Like, we can isolate ancient things and make maybe molecules that we don't have around that might be bioactive. Because if it's bioactive, if it's in a biological organism, it's probably bioactive. So it might be a way to find bioactive things. And if something's bioactive, then maybe it could be useful for health or for making other things that might be used in humans or agriculture. Because once it's bioactive, then it probably interacts with other mole- other biological molecules. Um, so it's really proof of principle. I think it's really cool that they did this. I think, you know, it's funny that they went into dental calculus and then they get out an organism you don't expect, and that's the one they follow up. I thought well, it was kind the of- The DNA is pr- protected in dental calculus. E- right. So it's protected, but I still thought it was interesting they picked the chlorobium out and not another organism, yeah. but probably because it might be the best conserved. I mean, I know people have done this and actually, Michael, you'll know this for sure. My understanding is that some of the organisms in our mouth have adapted to a, 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 our diet yes. over the years. So like if I think people have looked at dental calculus from you know Neanderthals or ancient humans and found that the- It's uh, dependent upon our diets. Yes. It depends on the diet. Yeah. yeah we did a is, paper on that on TWIM a, a few years back, if I'm remembering right. Yeah. So this is also kind of an interesting idea that you take it. I mean, and then you make these natural products. I just thought it was really neat and uh, just kind of like opens your mind. It did have a little Jurassic Park, but again, they're not trying to recreate the organism. They're just trying to express some of the genes that they found in the organism. Along those lines, yesterday when I was driving home from work, I had one of those NPR drive wave moments where they were describing the cloning and production of the woolly mammoth. And the woolly mammoth is of this era. So we can go back and see if chlorobium would end up in the woolly mammoth's tooth surfaces. Now, God knows what the woolly mammoth is going to eat, and it'll be miserable because they're also predicting that with this El Nino this year, we're going to have the hottest summers on record. (laughs) So the woolly mammoth, I don't think, will be all too pleased. (laughs) I don't think the, yeah, the woolly mammoth is going to be surprised and not all too pleased. Yes. Are we going to also do the saber toothed tiger? I was thinking we must be able to get, (laughs) have you been to, uh, well, actually the LA County Art Museum of LACMA, the LA County Museum of Art, right? Is next to La Brea Tar Pits. Yes. And there Mm. they have these perfectly preserved, essentially preserved in tar, the saber tooths. Right. Which would also be amazing. Although more scary than a woolly mammoth. The woolly mammoth seems like a furry elephant. Yes. Is the idea that you could do this and look for antimicrobial compounds? Absolutely. I think antimicrobials, but you can also use um, some of these compounds are useful in other industrial purposes or to make chemicals for surfactants. I don't know of this particular class, but um, yeah, there's a lot of molecules that bacteria can make more easily. Um, and so yeah. that's, and the more variation you get, the more you can find something new. If you want to look for antimicrobials, you really need to screen a lot of compounds. And so this methodology right. is not I, really. <laughs> they're looking I think for it's the, the chassis that they want. Yeah, the That's skeleton. It. They don't want the, uh, they're not necessarily testing them for antibiotics. They're okay. They're basically making something. And then if you can make a lot of it in a big fermenter instead of three liters, do 300 liters, then mm. you can have a lot of that and do a chemical modification on that to make it into an antibiotic. It might be a way around some of the more difficult chemical synthetic steps and make things cheaper, yeah. potentially, Especially or more when you look at the macrolide biosynthesis, the microbes do it so much more efficiently than any chemist mm. could ever imagine. It's simply because the reaction volume is so small and the reactants and the substrates are so near one another and they're just able to catalyze what was once explained to me by an Orcan, a chemist, the schizophrenic synthesis that the microbes are able to accomplish Mm -hmm. owing to their small size. And the streptomyces are the originator, original schizophrenic chemists. They, They can do almost anything. And people have been exploiting the uh, scaffolding or skeletons of the streptomyces to make novel compounds. Right. One idea is that some of these are like the polyketides and some of these biosynthetic clusters are big. And maybe you Mm -hmm. can move around a couple of genes or genetically engineer the genes so you can essentially change the product by changing the the, The essentially what's in that cluster. So 
And again, then they'll make these very complicated things. So I think there's a lot of cool stuff. And when we think about them looking for antibiotics, you're, you are limited by what the end product is. But here, it's more of a platform for making other things. So the choice of calculus is because they can get ancient remains that have that, right? The DNA is preserved. because It's just it's, old because you can't go into dirt and get ancient DNA because it's not ancient, right? No, because the calcium is surrounding it, so it's effectively in a hermetically sealed Coptic jaw. Uh, so they drill, they drill into the tooth to get. Uh, uh, I think it's just in or the scrape. calculus, the stuff they scrape. scrape off your teeth. Okay, but it's, it's old. That's the that. point. You it's could, old. You could, they have yeah. these these grave sites with old remains, yeah. right? It's yeah. mummified DNA on dental calculus. I mean, the problem is that I don't think the oral microbiome is that rich in diversity. Again, oh no, it's rich in diversity. It is rich enough. Okay. So that it, would be it's got only. at least a thousand between four hundred okay. and a thousand different species. And then it's probably changed along with diet oh, yeah. too. So yeah. Yeah, it's it's changed a lot. Right. Thank you, uh, Petra. Michael, but speaking of teeth, on the live stream last night, somebody asked <laughs> Oh no. So they keep their toothbrush in their bedroom, right? Okay. Like you said. And they want to know how long after they flush the toilet can they bring the toothbrush back in? Oh, that's a good question. It depends how clean and it <laughs> that's depends the on what we're talking about. It's it's the vo- it's the number of air exchanges per hour in their bathroom. So if they have a, a fan, whether or not the fan is run, uh to give the peop the lit our bulk of our listeners, the average uh laboratory changes its air eight times an hour. And mm. the average house is, of course, much, much less. And so it's about air exchanges and the size of the aerosol from the flush and the, the, how many gallons of water you had in the toilet. It's, it's complicated. Because, <laughs> Petra, what we're talking about is, uh, like Michael said, he, when he goes to a toilet, he doesn't leave the toothbrush in the bathroom because when you flush, it's an aerosol and it gets on the toothbrush, right? I just close the top of the toilet. Well, that doesn't actually, we did it a doesn't? paper on TWIV. It doesn't stop the aerosol, unfortunately. I used to think it, but then we did this paper where they seeded the water with M13 phage. And it even if you oh, close the lid, it. It's, okay. it ends up all over the floor. Yeah, so, uh, but does it end up all over night, your toothbrush? <laughs> yes, exactly. And so Michael keeps his toothbrush in his room. So someone said, could you just put the toothbrush in a container? Yeah, in the bathroom. That would help. Because like, you put it in your medicine cabinet. That seems to be okay. that. That, that works too. I don't know if people still have medicine cabinets anymore. I do. You do? Oh yeah. You must have an old house. We actually put them in a new bathroom though. Oh, that's interesting. They're very handy. Now they're very handy. They they the, the they get rid of them. have have these cabinets with the sink in it, and then there's just a mirror stuck on the wall. There's no more. Oh, but the medicine, the medicine cabinet. cabinet mirror opens, so you can see the back of your head. Yeah, right, right. Well, <laughs> those are small, right? If people yeah. want a big mirror, and they can't really open that up, so you can have both. <laughs> okay. How do I know? We're way off topic. <laughs> We're becoming twiv. We're digressing. That's okay. Michelle's not here. Yes, the police. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Petra, for that. I have a paper for you, which um, is a little bit different. Uh, it's uh, from cell host and micro. Plant mRNAs move into a fungal pathogen via extracellular vesicles to reduce infection by Wang He. Wu Kai, Ramirez Sanchez, Ebru Gudger, Birch, and Jin from UC California, Riverside Wuhan University, an institute in Mexico, Sinvestav, University of Edinburgh, and the University of Dundee. And so the fun the fungal part is what makes it twim. Right? Mm-hmm. This weekend my, so fun, fungi are included in our microbes here. But we rarely talk about them, right? Every mycologist is always feels like the like the <laughs> <laughs> the black sheep of the microbiology department. Elio used to keep us on the straight and narrow when it came to fungi. He he made certain that we had a smattering of fungi every now and then. Yes, right. And now we don't get that anymore. So I thought this would be good. This came across my 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 digital domain here and um it's about information transfer. And um, this happens a lot, right? Especially between hosts and microbes that infect the host. Toxins, metabolites, proteins can be transferred. But here the paper is interested in RNA, RNA transfer between hosts 
and uh, their microbes. And we know that uh, sh- small RNAs can be delivered into s- cells. So some microbes can deliver small RNAs into cells, and they can be regulatories, short interfering RNAs to silence genes. This is called cross-kingdom RNAi. <laughs> so a microbe will put it into a, a eukaryotic cell, and that's cross-kingdom. Also, transfer you can transfer small RNAs into microbes from the host the other way to uh, alter the, the virulence pattern of the microbe, for example. But these are small RNAs, and, and what they want to know in this paper is, could you move messenger RNAs between mm. hosts? And the answer is yes. To hear the, If you want to hear the short answer, the answer is yes. <laughs> and that's why Petra said, you could do this as a snippet <laughs> and just say, yes, it's a transfer. <laughs> <laughs> That's not actually it. I just thought it'd be a fun snippet. But, but it's, Yeah, it it's, could be a snippet too. It's really pretty cool. I mean, this is sort of a cross between type 4 and type 3 secretion. The type 4 mm-hmm. mean, but it's not conjugation per se because mm-hmm. it's RNA. I mean, right. And it's not using an injector, right? Correct. So here well, type the, the, 4 uses pili. Type pili. 4 uses pili. And type what uses the injector? Six? Type three. Type, type, three, type three, three uses the injector. I mean, this, there's just no way to know unless you memorize it what three and, and four is, right? It also reminds me, though, of um, bacterial outer membrane secretion. Absolutely. Of vesicles, OMBs. Yeah. Yeah, they make vesicles too, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, a lot of them. Yeah. <laughs> What's so old is new to the microbial world. Well, I was going to say nothing is, has been invented by eukaryotes, right? It's all, it's all been stolen. Um, the carriers in this case are extracellular vesicles. So this is going to be um, from a plant, and they make extracellular vesicles. These are small membrane vesicles that are released from cells, and they they have been found in plants and, and mammalian cells. They have a lot of molecules in them. They have proteins, they have lipids, nucleic acids, they have metabolites, and they are how cells communicate with each other. And people are thinking of using these for diagnostics and therapeutics and so forth because they they leave one cell and then they go to another and get into it and deliver the cargo. And so, um, for example, in plants, these vesicles are known to uh, contain small RNAs that uh, um, traffic from the host to the microbe to uh, modulate infection. And there is a fungal pathogen, Botrytis cinerea. That's uh, Botrytis is going to be the, uh, isn't that like noble rot mm-hmm. on grapes? Botrytis, which uh, causes gray mold disease on many plants. And uh, these plants uh, try to put small RNAs into the botrytis by, uh, by these extracellular vesicles. Uh, also, we know there's a fungal pathogen of, of maize. It's called Ustalagomidis. Gosh, that's an old model organism, right? Mm-hmm. I've been hearing about that for years. That uh, makes extracellular vesicles with mRNAs in it. And that's thought to allow it to better establish itself uh, in in the plant. But uh, what they want to know here is whether plant extracellular vesicles can transport mRNAs, so something other than small RNAs. And can these mRNAs move from the plants to the microbe? Uh, are they translated into protein? And do they any do they do anything? Those are the questions that we're going to look at in this paper. And the answer is yes. <laughs> they mRNAs do get into extracellular vesicles. They get into the fungal cells. They're translated into protein, and they uh, reduce uh, the growth of the fungus uh, in the plant. And this is a big deal agriculturally, right? Fungal Absolutely. diseases are a big problem. And so actually these uh, institutions here, the Center for Plant Cell Biology, here's the State Laboratory of Hybrid Rice. That's in China. That's a good one. I like that very much. Uh, genomics. So the vision of plant scientists, so many people are interested in that. So the, f- the first thing they do is they take uh, their, their model organism plant, Arabidopsis, right, uh, which is genetically manipulable and easy to grow and quickly growing in the lab. It's a model plant. So they collect extracellular vesicles and they ask, can we find mRNAs in them? So they purify the extracellular vesicles and they go through a lot of uh, machinations to make sure they're pure. Uh, and then they extract the RNA and they do sequencing of those RNAs to see what's inside of them. 
and they find 567 Arabidopsis transcripts uh, in these vesicles. Uh, and they do it actually after uh, early and later after infection. So they infect these um, Arabidopsis with botrytis, uh, and uh, they do mock infected, and they collect the extracellular vesicles um, 16 hours after infection. They can find 567 transcripts in these uh, extracellular vesicles at 16 hours. Th- about 30% of them are actually induced after infection compared to uninfected leaves. And uh, they look at what these mRNAs encode, and they encode genes associated with biotic stress, defense responses, detoxification, uh, defenses to fungi, and and immune responses, and so forth. So it makes sense that uh, they would be turned up. So basically, when you infect the plant with the fungus, you turn up the presence of mRNAs in these extracellular vesicles. Now, there is some... Um, there's a, there's a gene, there, there's several genes in uh, plants that regulate the production of extracellular vesicles. And so there's, uh, there are tetraspanin genes, tet, tet8 and tet9, that are, seem to be important in producing these. And if you make mutant mutations in these genes, you make fewer extracellular vesicles. So they do that experiment also to show that these mRNAs that you normally see induced after fungal infection, they're no longer, they're, they're hardly detectable if you do that in a, in a TET8, TET9 double knockout. So they say, looks like there's mRNAs in uh, extracellular vesicles besides small RNAs. Uh, <laughs> and then they do a series of broccoli experiments, <laughs> which is not the plants, but they use a, 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 an imaging system, um, a fluorescence imaging system to look at uh, the mRNAs. So they pick a couple of uh, mRNAs and they tag them in the way so they can look at them in these extracellular vesicles. And so um, you can purify the vesicles. This time they're using Nicotiana bentham- benthamiana because that is genetically manipulable. You can make transgenic plants pretty easily with those. And they, they put in um, versions of these uh, plant proteins that that can be detected by the broccoli <laughs> fluorescent system. Actually, it's a fluorescent RNA detection system for RNA imaging. And they can detect them in um, in plants by this method. So they look at two genes in particular, SAG21 and APS1, and <clears throat> both of these are found in plant mitochondria. SAG21 is induced by infection with B. cinerea uh, and also many other bacterial and fungal pathogens. And um, plant, if you make a transgenic plant that overproduces SAG21, they are they are less susceptible to infection with B. cinerea and also Pseudomonas syringi, syringiae. Um, APS1, on the other hand, is induced by infection with B. cinerea. It, it seems to be uh, involved in biosynthesis of metabolites that are toxic to fungal cells. So an antifungal protein is induced. So they want to know if it's involved in B. cinerea infection. So they make transgenic plants uh, producing these uh, mRNAs, so SAG21, APS1, and then they have a control. And they can find um, the RNAs uh, in, in the vesicles produced from those plants. So again, two, two proteins or two mRNAs, encoding proteins that seem to be involved in fungal defense are present in extracellular vesicles in uh, uh, in in the I plant mean, yeah. cells, they're they're going to a lot of trouble to show that there's correlation, like that mm-hmm. they're yeah. linked, because it, it's very hard to, with any of these extracellular vesicles, even the bacterial ones. It's very difficult to show that they're not just forming randomly; that there's a yeah. response pathway. And I think that's setting them up for one yeah. of their principal conclusions out of their discussion. And what they say is cross kingdom trafficking of mm. these mRNAs is more likely is likely to be more effective than trafficking of proteins for modulating microbial infection due to the ability of the mRNAs to be translated into many protein molecules inside the interacting microbial cells. Remember, Beck, these mRNAs are plastic, if you will. They're they're able to be made into stuff, thus amplifying 
the consequences. Yeah. Well, no, I'm sense. wondering yeah. though, though, if you're putting it into Pseudomonas, right, you're not going to have the binding site that you're going to have. If you take a capped mRNA and you put it into a fungus, it's going to get translated. But if you put it into Pseudomonas, it's not. It doesn't work that way. No. Mm. That's right. So it's All interesting. Right. Uh-huh. Anyway, so now these mRNAs, including some antifungal uh, mRNAs, are in extracellular vesicles. Do they get into fungal cells, mm-hmm. right? That's the next question. So the experiment is they infect Arabidopsis. <laughs> they, they, sorry. <laughs> He's laughing because. <laughs> She's yawning. I think it must be boring. <laughs> no, just sorry. allergies. You're tired? <laughs> allergies. Allergies. That makes you tired? Really? It's not sleeping because of allergies. Oh, you don't sleep. Tired. That'll do it. All right. So they, they infect uh, Arabidopsis with B. cinerae, and then they, um, so the, the B. cinerae are within the plant, right? Then they mm-hmm. purify the B. cinerae from the plant, and they look for uh, the presence of uh, mRNAs in the fungus. And they look for these SAG-21, APS-1, and a few others. And they can find uh, the plant mRNAs in the fungal cells. So they say this, this indicates that they're taken up. And they do a lot of experiments to show that it's not just sticking to them or mm-hmm. something like that, right? And they have some other transcripts in the plant that are not usually found in the extracellular vesicles. And those are not in the fungal cells. So that's a nice control, right? So they're not just random mRNAs are being taken taken up. So they say this, okay, full-length uh, EV-associated plant mRNA, mRNAs are transferred into fungal cells. They um, then do a nice experiment where they have plants that are TET 8, 9 knocked out, which makes fewer extracellular vesicles, and you get fewer plant mRNAs in those fungal cells when you do the same experiment. So it looks like this exosome pathway is delivering this. That's a nice experiment because it shows those are exosomes delivering the mRNAs. Uh, Another experiment they did was to, so they have transgenic lines of Arabidopsis. Now now we're shifting to uh, Arabidopsis. And they are making tagged versions of these SAG-21 and APS-1 and a control protein. And they they take um, extracellular vesicles from those tagged gene expressing cells. So now they can visualize fluorescently the RNAs. And they add those to uh, the B. cinerea conidia in vitro. So they purify the extracellular vesicles, add them to the B. cinerea conidia, and then they can do their fluorescence assay to detect those um, mRNAs in the fungal cells. So the more evidence that they're they're actually getting in there. And now, so this is all kind of experiment um, experimentally artificial situation. So what about during a natural infection? So I thought, oh, they're going to go out in the field and look for, it. but no, <laughs> it's just an infection in the laboratory. So yeah. <laughs> they take. Uh, their transgenic Arabidopsis with their tagged uh, uh, mRNAs, and they isolate uh, B. cinerea from them. So this is a natural infection of a transgenic line, and they can find fungal cells showing fluorescence of these particular transcripts, right, SAG-21 and APS-1, and they can also find the full-length transcripts in there. So uh, that's what they call a natural infection. So they have a plant in the lab that's infected with B. cinerea and uh, they can see this transfer. Uh, I guess you could <laughs> you could take these transgenic plants and put them in a field and <laughs> and look at this, but people would probably get mad, right? That you oh yeah, put a transgenic plant in a field in an open field. Oh my gosh, <laughs> what could happen? Um, well, but, these are also are they Arabidopsis? Or they're... Um, the transgenics are yeah, these are Arabidopsis. Yeah, too. that's the, not. They also just probably wouldn't do that in the field. They wouldn't do yeah. They're, they're basically weeds also. Mm-hmm. Yes. Why do a field when you can do it in a growth chamber? Mm-hmm. Where it's much more controlled. Exactly. I mean, at some point you want to know if this happens in nature, right? Yeah. So you have to figure out some experiment to do. I don't know what it would be. Well, but... their fluorescence data is pretty convincing. If you look yeah. at figure sure. four, yeah, specifically panel D, it, it's pretty neat. No, it's fine. But it's I think it would be worth looking at like a natural fungal. Um, we have somebody who works on powdery mildew in our department. Mm-hmm. Like you could look at powdery mildew and look for plant-derived uh, 
mRNAs in the powdery mildew pretty easily. I mean, it's everywhere. It's a, it's a pathogen. You know, it's, it's right. nature is doing it for you. All you have to do is match the mRNAs, right? I mean, this, you don't even need to set up the experiment exactly, do you? No. You, you, it's like the Neanderthal experiment all over again. Except <laughs> you scrape do. the powder. No, and you can just off. isolate the fungal spores from plants in the field and see if they have plant mRNAs. In yeah, there, right? that would probably. Be yeah, good. I think you. And again, this is one. This is a really common pathogen. So. Yeah. So next, they want to know if the if the mRNAs which are in the plants from the uh, from the fungi, sorry, from the plants, are they translated into protein? So they isolate ribosomes from uh, the fungal cells. And they um, uh, they sequence them, and um, they can see these these EV transferred mRNAs are associated with ribosomes, which suggests that they're being translated, right? And they can sequence this and find a lot of plant uh, mRNAs, three hundred twenty plant protein coding mRNAs associated with fungal ribosomes and multiple replicates. And again, the defense response genes are highly enriched here. Uh, they say that. Um, Chloropast genome-derived mRNAs and nuclear photosynthesis-associated mRNAs are not enriched uh, in these ribosomes. So that uh, th- there's no contamination, in other words, uh, when they're doing this experiment where they're taking ribosomes and sequencing them. Okay, so they seem to be ribosome-associated. Mm-hmm. Um, when they say, well, this could be monosomes and single ribosomes and not polysomes, which is really where the translation is happening, right? So, hmm, polysome sucrose gradients. Wow. Ooh, that's old time religion. <laughs> My gosh, that's old stuff, but people still do it. Oh, yeah. And the cool thing now is that you can, so basically you have a sucrose gradient that goes from X percent, 10%, say, to 30% sucrose in a tube, and you can centrifuge extracts, and the, and the polysomes will distribute through the gradient depending on how many ribosomes they have attached. Are loaded to onto the RNA. And so you can purify, you can take different fractions of the sucrose gradient. You can actually uh, probe for specific RNAs and see how they're distributed. So what they do this here and um, they look for, they do PCR across these sucrose gradient fractions and they look for SAG21 and APS RNAs and they find them on the polysomes, which would be the heavier, the faster sedimenting yeah. ones have more ribosomes, right? And the monosomes Actively would be at the top. Yeah, actively translated. And then how would you inhibit translation? Because there, are, there is a way to disrupt polysomes. It would be with a drug called puramycin, which mm-hmm. again has been used for years to break up polysomes. And you, you take the, uh, the fungal cell lysis, you treat them with puramycin, it disrupts the polysomes. Then you put it on a sucrose gradient and you see that uh, everything is in the monosome now. So you had bona fide polysomes there. And the, the mRNAs were the plant mRNAs were associated with them. Remember, these are polysomes from fungal cells. All right, so the, the, the mRNAs we're doing this step by step. The <laughs> mRNAs are on the polysomes. So they translated into protein. <laughs> so they make fluorescent protein conjugated uh, versions of these SAG twenty one and APS one, and they make some that are where they put a stop code on in. So you don't get the protein made as they're controlled. Um, and then um, they find, for example, when in the plants making uh, these proteins, the fluorescent proteins are not exported into extracellular vesicles. And, and that's good because it's the mRNAs that they think are being exported um, in the extracellular vesicles. And in that experiment, there's no protein, but still the fungi get these uh, fluorescent SAG-21 and APS-1, so it has to be through the uh, the mRNA. And so where do the proteins go, Vincent? Well, they show that the proteins are made because they take yes. extracellular vesicles from uninfected and infected Arabidopsis with these yellow fluorescent protein-fused genes, and they show that the fungi fluoresce, so they're translating the mRNA. So where do they go? Well, first of all, Michael, you jumped the uh, Oh, I jumped, I jumped it out of your order. Order that well, it's the paper order. I, I mean, I don't care. Okay, but but they say can these mRNAs uh, do anything to the fungus? Right? Okay, so they're, they're okay, I did jump a step. Yes, and so they measure fungal growth, and they see that uh, with SAG twenty one and APS one being transferred, it reduces uh, fungal growth, and um, you know the controls don't have reduced 
Correct. Yeah, so the, these these mRNAs are, are apparently limiting uh, infection. And as Michael wanted to know, these proteins, that SAG21 and APS1, which are yellow fluorescent protein tag, they localize to the mitochondria of the botrytis, and uh, they cause morphological changes in the mitochondria. Well, that, uh, when, they, where the fungi principally gets its energy from. So that's yeah, going to kill the fungus. That's right. They say the morph the morphology change of the mitochondria likely disrupts their function and perturbs the network uh, formed between fungal mitochondria, which is important for energy generation. Yeah. So that's pretty interesting. Um, and then um, they have some Arabidopsis that lack the genes for SAG21 and APS1, and they infect them with B. cinerea, and they get they're, they're more susceptible to infection. Uh, so it looks like these two genes, SAG21, APS1, they produce mRNAs that get incorporated into extracellular vesicles. And if a fungus is infecting the plant, these EVs go into the fungus and they reduce it, their replication. Ending the so, story, it's all about fitness, folks. It's all about fitness. These mRNAs reduce the fitness of the fungus and the right. plant is able to defend itself. It's It's really quite remarkable um it's a fitness function so what i found interesting in their discussion is that you know there's obviously selective loading of mrnas into these extracellular vesicles and uh in mammalian cells that's been studied the the incorporation of micrornas into extracellular vesicles depends on a motif a four to seven uh, nucleotide motif that is present in the microRNA. MicroRNA is only about 21 nucleotides, so a little bit of it is devoted to getting the microRNA uh, into the extracellular vesicles. And so they say maybe a similar thing is happening here. Um, and they, they're, they're studying that. They have some RNA binding proteins that um, may be involved in getting the mRNAs in there. And also 20%, over 20% of uh, the plant mRNAs that get into fungal cells by these vesicles are predicted to target mitochondria or mitochondria and pleuroplasts, chloroplasts. So that's quite interesting. So uh, that's a big target, as Michael said, and that's what many of these proteins seem to be doing, perturbing the mitochondria. Do you think they were originally for bacteria, Michael? I don't know. Uh, I, I, <laughs> yeah. don't, I, don't, I don't know because bacteria... You know, their messages are inherently right. unstable. Mm -hmm. And I don't well, and think also they can't translate these. So. No, they can't translate these. So I don't I don't think I think this is an adaptation to the eukaryotic protein synthetic machinery. Yeah, I agree. Now whether mm -hmm. or not they're in the archaea, that's the question. But the archaea principally are protein they're a cross between eukaryotic protein synthesis and bacterial protein synthesis but that that's the the real question but it's it's interesting nevertheless of how these rnas are moving and you know i guess i'm too much of a prokaryotic biologist that i always think of mrnas as being inherently unstable you know with the 20 second to minute half life of an mrna and a bacterium <laughs> i just remember <laughs> purifying them in hot phenol oh something. that's what i did boiling yeah, phenol you poured fun. the rna in oh my gosh oh yeah it was horrible horrible i smelled like phenol for days after those experiments it's a bad smell yeah oh yeah well they say that uh, maybe this can help us uh, control plant diseases right i guess you can deliver mRNAs into plant pathogens <laughs> with these extracellular vesicles, although, well, why not? With the nanoparticle vaccines are kind of similar, the COVID vaccines. They're yeah, mRNAs encased in a, in a lipid nanoparticle. Yeah. It's not an extracellular vesicle, but it's the same idea. So, um, Would those plants I, then be labeled as transgenic? I don't know. I mean, it's not incorporated into the genome. Right? No, so, I, I don't so, think so but it's it's definitely using that we're vaccinating the plant, so to speak, with these yeah. vesicles. That would be the idea. So we'll see if it goes anywhere anyway. But I thought that was an interesting. It's very cool, Vincent. Thank yeah. you. Story, and it's got fungi, which we haven't 
talked about. So now fun, fungi, we have, there's a guy on the live stream who um, oh, loves fungi and he always says, you, you should have more fun fungi on TWIM. Okay. More <laughs> fungi. Ones, I, I, I'll look for the fungi. TWIM needs more fungi. Just like TWIM needs more cowbell. More <laughs> cowbell. More, instead of cowbell and fungi. Instead, I guess you could right, have fun. crypto. Uh, what's the, uh, oh, Canada. Canada's oh, basically dull. It it just makes <laughs> really? thrush. It just makes thrush. I'm going to get letters. It just makes thrush. Just makes thrush. <laughs> the Canada people will be up in arms. Doesn't oh, it yes. Also do, doesn't it also do bloodstream infections? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Canada Especially is, if, if you're immunocompromised, Oh, right? if it gets out, it's bad. Mm. It's I feel bad. like it's the staphylococcus of the fungi. It's it is. Everywhere. It, it is. staph oh. of the fungi. <laughs> it's, it's got lot. It's got panoply of virulence factors and... It has that dimorphic schizophrenia. Um, yeah, it's it's nasty. And then we, we have this new uh, candida, right? The uh, orans, right? Well, there's orans, there's KCI. Oh, yeah, orans is interesting, though, just because it's only a recent development. Emergence, yeah. yes. Oris, yeah. oris, sorry. Yeah. Oris. A-U-R-I-S. Healthcare facility associated. Yes. Our, our clinical microbiologist has put a sign over her door that she will not allow it into our buildings. You know, she doesn't want any patient to come in with it because she doesn't want it in uh, the patient care suites for fear it will get out of control. Okay. Well, sometimes it comes in unknowingly, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. she She's well aware of that. That's why she put up the signs because she's convinced they can read. The fungi yep. can read. I see. And they're going to stay out. Okay. And they're going to stay out. You have to meet our clinical microbiologist at the next microbe meeting. I'll introduce you to her and you'll, okay. you'll get a sense of why she put signs on her doors and whatnot. Are you guys going to microbe this year? I am going to microbe. Petra's not. Well, no. we'll do a twim there, Michael. Yes, we will. And I'll do a twiv as well. All right. That is a twim 306. Uh, you can find show notes at microbe.tv slash twim. If you enjoy this kind of discussion, we'd love to have your support to continue. Uh, you can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. Your deductions are U.S. federal tax deductible because we are a nonprofit corporation. And if you love, if you want to send questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. Twim at microbe.tv. Michael Schmidt, Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. Petra Levin, Washington University in St. Louis. Thank you, Petra. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.